welcome back to the Kingsway Podcast. Welcome. Thanks so much for being here. And you're back for another study hall. Yes. A Sunday study hall. I uh, was talking to Ryan about this. This is uh, probably one of the shorter amounts of texts that we've ever done on a Sunday morning. Yeah. What is it? Five? Five verses. verses. And yet it feels like something that we could probably talk about for a very long time. Yes. So, Uh, so, so long. So this is probably going to be... A pretty interesting, I think, a very interesting um, Sunday study. Not that all of them aren't going to be somewhat, but I just feel like this yeah. is pretty pivotal, and it's in all four Gospels, which always makes it something that everybody was like, this is important. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just a reminder why why we're doing these Sunday, Sunday study halls. These are to expand on, talk about the things that maybe we didn't get to talk about correct or make things more clear that were in the sermon that maybe we wish we would have said a little different. Or talk about things that we just didn't have time to. Yeah. Um, and to clarify, you can watch this being a person who heard the sermon and you're like going off the sermon a ton. But we do a little recap at the beginning. So if you missed it, don't worry about it. But also, we're these are pretty much just talking about scripture. Yeah. So we're just on a scripture passage. So if you know that passage at all, um, if you haven't read it in a while or heard it in a while, you might pause the video right now and look up the scripture that's in the title of this video. Read it for yourself. Think about it for a minute and then come back. Um, but, yeah, this is for anybody. It's it's mostly for people from our church, mm-hmm. but literally anybody can get good stuff out of this. And the, and the whole point of our podcast is just be curious learners. Yeah. That's all it is. And we're just trying to, to, to dig into things, ask questions, learn, grow, uh, expand, and start conversations and discussions. And so no matter who you are, you're welcome to join us on that. Absolutely. <laughs> So, are you going to make me do this, like, quick intro thing? A hundred percent. I hate so, doing this. So, so before, hard. Before you do it, before uh-huh. you do it, the first question is, uh, what text did he preach on? So, we're, we are doing the last little bit of the chapter three of Matthew. It's the last five verses of chapter three. So, it's, it's, it's Jesus' baptism, yep. but it is verses 13 through 17. Okay. Okay, so now is the time where uh, if you're watching this podcast on YouTube, you can see my giant dumb timer. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Trevor, hopefully in 90 seconds, is going to recap what he preached on when he preached mm. this text. You ready? I'm ready. Three, two, one, go. So this text, though short, is very dense. Um, it is also the very pivotal moment that Jesus takes his life from being a carpenter in a very far off place um, I shouldn't say far off, but a very small place to taking his first steps towards his ministry and his actual mission. And so this is a pivotal moment where Jesus steps out of his carpenter work and starts working on his Messiah work. And he meets John the Baptist, and John the Baptist has, of course, been preaching and praying and asking people to repent because the kingdom is near. And then all of a sudden Jesus shows up and he's like, here he is. And Jesus does this crazy thing where he asks John to actually baptize him, which is wild and in so many ways is a representation of his entire ministry that he's going to humble himself, that he's actually going to put himself in shameful, difficult situations for our benefit. And so he does this, he says, to fulfill righteousness so that everything God wants to have happen happens. And Timothy Keller mentions this that God put, we put ourselves where God could only be, so Jesus puts himself where man should only be. And through that work, he's going to do that. So the baptism represents the start of kind of that whole imagery and thought. And then at the very end, we see that God now is speaking directly to the people and Jesus has that authority for that communication and his ministry is off and running. And so now every time Jesus speaks, he has the authority from God's confirmation, but he also has the triune God, Holy Spirit, him, one mission on mission. Here we go. Yep. Great. Yeah, I feel like there were like three big points in there. Mm-hmm. This is the inauguration to his ministry. Yep. So like like when a president gets sworn into office. Yep. They were elected, they knew they were going to do this, but there's like the day yeah. which in 2020 was January 6th where uh-huh. or 1 21? Mm-hmm. 21. Yeah, I was wrong. Uh where they actually put their hand on the Bible get sworn in. This is like Jesus ceremony coming into office yep. as the Messiah. Um and- And this is God breaking his silence to the full extent after 400 years of silence. He 
he spoke kind of a little bit through John the Baptist's dad when his mm -hmm. mom was pregnant with him, and and then he spoke to some shepherds and to Mary through some angels and to somebody through a dream and whatever. But now he's like, it's me. It's he's really here. me. <laughs> it's funny to say God's here in the flesh. He is, <sighs> but he's here like like audible voice from heaven level. Yeah, and, speaking. and that that whole, you know, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Yeah. Um, that line is the line that God is ultimately going to use Jesus to say to the whole world. Yeah. And that's what John John 3.16 basically is. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Yeah. So that <laughs> we could know that, he, that we are loved. God did not yeah. come into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. Um, it's the prodigal son. It's the whole, I mean, it's all that thing. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's the whole gospel in one little short narrative. And Jesus taking this humble position is pretty wild. Now, the third point you mentioned, which I didn't mention yet, that gets into our first question. Oh, okay. Uh, is that Jesus chooses somebody who considers himself unworthy. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, this is not a new thing in the Bible. Isaiah 6. Yeah. The man of unclean lips, whatever. Mm -hmm. But talk to us about the significance of him choosing John to so, baptize him. So I think there's a lot of significance in John and Jesus' relationship. And you and I have even talked about how we don't know how much John knew. Like, yeah. did he recognize Jesus was, like, at 12 when Jesus, yeah. like, st stepped on a puddle and didn't go down? Like, was he like, what? Like, yeah. <laughs> or, we, I, I think when I grew up reading it, I assumed it was, like, prophetic. Mm -hmm. God was like, hey, that's him. And he was like, hey, it's the Messiah. But they are cousins. They did grow up together. And it's a very small town. And it's a very small town. Mm -hmm. And after watching The Chosen uh, TV show about Jesus that so we've done a bunch of review episodes of, so if you're interested in that, we think it's really good. Mm -hmm. And we're not generally Christian media people. We're no. not like, no, we're like not. I don't want to name movies and make you think that we think that they're bad or you're bad for watching them, but Fireproof and Courageous are not our favorite movies. Yeah. Or God's Not Dead. Not saying they're bad, but we're. this drew us out of thinking that generally about all those movies the chosen did and we both really really oh, like yeah. it. it it puts the best version of the best flesh on jesus yeah. ever humanity and him seen a lot of good depictions of the divine jesus in his 30 years walking around floating above the ground because mm -hmm. he can't walk because he's too holy but this is the best human not only human but the best representation of jesus as a human we've ever seen absolutely where people do want to invite him to parties P kids do want to hang out with him. Absolutely. All and the other Jesuses, you're like, kind of cold, kind of stoic. scary. Yeah. Surprised he's not played by Liam Neeson, just like standoffish <laughs> and just like, I have um, a very particular set of skills. Anyway, all that to say, they make the decision, story-wise, to say that Jesus and John grew up together and know each other very well. Yes, and I think that's what makes some of this more significant, because obviously like, he's yeah. going to somebody who knows. But I don't think that's necessarily what Matthew, because Matthew doesn't note that. Yeah. Matthew doesn't even mention that. It's it's the significance that I think Matthew sees is that this is somebody that's not at the temple. Yeah. That is calling people to a promised land called the kingdom, the, the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. That is symbolic of where they cross the Jordan to get to the current yeah. promised land and is doing what the temple is supposed to be doing, but is not. Yeah. And is not somebody of the levite line but it's just someone who's listening is to god is he not because his dad was oh he is from the levite he line. is from the levite, levite line. line and he's doing what the priest should be doing and he's doing it for repentance yeah. not for righteousness which yeah. is crazy so there's this whole intricate intricate in intricate there we go yeah i almost said integrate yeah. <laughs> there's this whole intricate mm -hmm. sacrificial system going on up in Jerusalem mm -hmm. at the temple. And if you wanted to make sacrifices, I'm pretty sure you have to go all the way there. Yep. I don't think you can make those at synagogues. No. Those are just educational, religious Especially repentance. Yeah, those synagogues are more Bible studies where the temple is more church, but mm -hmm. there's only one church in the world. And so the is wild crazy. moment is this is, um, <laughs> this is garden imagery. Yeah. This is Adam taking the... Um, the apple and immediately he is dirty and needs he's naked and he's yeah. going to be cast out from the garden this is yeah. man baptizing god in repentance 
and then their relationship immediately being yelled from the heavens that it is good and that he loves him and that he's clean. He is showing every human being exactly what it's going to take to restore their relationship with God. I need to look something up real quick. No, I need to see something. It is. But there, there's an idea that came to my head that I want to see how this actually works. Yeah. John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, voice calling in the wilderness. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Jerusalem was going out to him. They were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Uh, Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, I will baptize you with repentance, with, with water for repentance. He was coming after me is mightier than I. Uh, fandal, whose sandals I'm not fit to untie, who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire his winnowing fork. Okay. Uh, so repentance is not necessarily forgiveness of sins. No. Repentance is changing your ways. Yep. It is a commitment to a new lifestyle. Now, it can very easily be a part of your forgiveness of sins, your re- redemption for sins. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, this word right here is about turning around and changing direction. So there is a level to where John is baptizing other people for repentance of sins, but him baptizing Jesus might be for repentance, Mm -hmm. but it might not. I don't think it's for sins yet. No, I think Jesus has not and will not ever sin. It's to turn back to God. It's to turn back to God, right? Yeah. But I think, could you not say that the repentance Jesus is doing is changing course from carpentry mm-hmm. to being the savior of the world. A hundred percent. So this, even in the word repentance, mm-hmm. it's about him changing careers mm-hmm. more than it is about him being forgiven. Oh yeah. Okay. And I would say it's not it, the, the forgiveness part of why he's going down there to repent. It's the same way that it, it, he's washes the, the disciples feet. Like he's trying to demonstrate for them what it's going to take in yeah. order to make this relationship whole, it's going to take them humbling themselves, yeah. humbling themselves completely. This is this is Jesus being fully human while being divine. It's it's a demonstration of something going on that's a tension. It's a tension for him because he he needs to go down there and be fully human, and a human yeah. would have to go down there and do it. Now the wild thing is, it's John the Baptist. John the Baptist is going to be declared later by Jesus as the greatest ever born of woman. Mm-hmm. Which, in some ways, you're like, how does he know that? Has he met Michael Jordan? Uh huh. But then, but then you're like, if if this is the single guy that Jesus, if this is the guy that Jesus spent the single most time with, because they happen to be around each other, potentially, it makes yeah. more sense that he's the greatest because he's the guy that spent the most time with Jesus on Earth. Yeah. And now he looks the best. No, that's again, that's conjuncture from reading between the lines. But it also makes you go. This is somebody that he's loved, served, and hung out with before, and he's cared about. And John is very sure that it's like, even at a human level, I think, mm-hmm. he's like, you're, you don't need to be here. <laughs> you're like, you're yeah. like, you're a really good dude. Like, yeah. I don't know. But then I think the divine confirm afterwards where it's like, nope, this is my son who I'm well pleased. You wonder at that point if John goes, I knew it. Yeah. I knew it. Yeah. I knew it all along. Me gotta agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, There's a few other little um, uh, allusions in here, just ties to other oh, kind of references to other this scriptures. This is other chocked moments. full. So uh, one, I don't, know how much you looked into this, how much you guys talked about it at the meeting, uh, the preaching planning meeting we have mm. with some people from our church to talk about the text. Every um, week, it's wildly fun. It is great. Uh, but I don't know how much you talked about this. But uh, it talks about his garments. Verse 4, mm-hmm. John had, sorry, now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's last week's sermon. You're right. What am I looking at? The, the last I, five verses. Yeah. But you're however, right. however, that is a that's the the same clothing as Elijah. Yeah. Which I use. Oh, which, okay. I remember where I was going. Okay. Mm-hmm. Same clothing as Elijah, but also to a certain extent, it is similar clothing to Adam. Mm-hmm. So Romans in Romans, Paul makes a big deal about uh, Jesus and Adam being 
two of the same starting points that humanity can choose from mm. or two of the same figurative heads yep. that humanity can start from. Uh, when you see a picture of Abraham Lincoln, you don't think uh, the Lincoln family. You think <laughs> uh, America. Yep. And so like in, in a similar way, but more theologically rich way, these are two heads that people can choose to align themselves with. Mm -hmm. And so there's something cool about Jesus being the new Adam. He's Adam, but he's making all the right choices. Yeah. And so part of that is he, Jesus is the son of God. He's part of the Godhead. He needs to be God to save everybody mm -hmm. and to do his messianic work. But he also needs to be human. Yep. And so not only was he born of a woman and raised by human parents, had a very human job, carpentry. I bet he hit his thumb with his hammer a handful of times and said, oh, me. And, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> um, but this, uh, in a way similar to uh, 1 Samuel 16, with the prophet Samuel yep. going out and anointing the king, the representative yep. of God's chosen people to God, that even though it's not anointing oil and it's not anointing and it's not oil, it is inaugurating Jesus' start of this role as the head human, yep. even though nobody notices it. Same way that Jesus' crucifixion is his inauguration as king, even though they think it's a mockery, it's actually his real inauguration with his real crown, his real robes, uh, into suffering and into kingship everlasting. Well, and to take that even further, Ryan, it, it's the same thing he says in Nicodemus in three. Yeah. He is born of water of woman, but he is also born yeah. of spirit. Yeah. And so he is both. Yeah. And that's what allows him to bridge both these positions as Adam. So when, when he tells Nicodemus, you, you can't be born, you got to be born again. He's talking about yeah. this precise moment. John the Baptist is baptizing with Adam's repentance Jesus is being baptized and he receives the spirit. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and you so watch the spirit, same for Samuel 16. Mm -hmm. You watch the spirit come to Saul when mm -hmm. he's anointed. And yep. then Saul keeps uh, not blaspheming the spirit. I don't know exactly what that means. And you probably don't either, audience. Uh, denying, but, its, denying, its, <laughs> denying its power or, or trying to manipulate and control its power. Well, then, yes, then exactly <laughs> that. Uh, trying to use the God superpowers from the Holy Spirit to do the Saul's will, yep. his own will. Yep. And he's king. He's a representative before God of God's chosen people. Yep. Well, then uh, God and Samuel are like, you've lost out on this. Yep. You, are, you are disobeying God and, and going in your own direction. I'm going to anoint who God leads me to, which is David. Mm -hmm. David's so much runtier and yep. smaller mm -hmm. and younger. But God anoints him, and the Spirit leaves Saul and goes to him. Yep. Now, if you're a regular Israelite, one of God's chosen people back then, you have no hope of getting the Holy Spirit yourself. You just have the hope of following the guy who has the Holy Spirit. Yep. Well, now, Jesus is inaugurated as the main human yep. and as the, the high priest in, in the way that you relate to God. And the Holy Spirit descends on him. I don't mm -hmm. know if he was there before, but at least he looked yep. like a dove in that moment. Uh -huh. uh, but there's a chance that it means that the Holy Spirit was not with Jesus in that kind of way before and now is with Jesus in that kind of way as the figurative head, the leader of humans. And you mentioned this in our meeting, and I think it's really, really important to think about, and it's attention, like whether or not Jesus could do miracles before this moment, whether or not there was anything miraculous it yeah. seems to be that there's some evidence that that he had some sort of level of knowledge that was beyond. It's, yeah. I, I'm using it when he's teaching out of Isaiah um, yeah. in the temple. And yeah. it seems to be like they're like he teaches like beyond anything we know. You know, yeah. like they were overwhelmed with how much he understood. It makes me think of the Disney animated movie Hercules mm -hmm. where he finally meets his dad, Zeus. Yep. And you're like. Is this guy not around the past 16 years or whatever? Yeah. It's, we all have that question. If you read the gospels and try to figure out what Jesus was doing early on. Yep. You're like, I got one section, one story, and that's it, it. from two years old to 30 years old. And it's basically the story that probably Joseph and Mary wish everyone forgot. It's yeah. The one where they're like, can we just leave? <laughs> where they left him. At where the they left him. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. they forgot him. I, I think it's cool to think about, though, that Jesus completely empties himself. Yeah. And this is a embarrassing, not a place that you go for, for like prestige or yeah. a power grab. This is a place you go when you're at your lowest, when things are not going well. People are not going out to the desert because they want to get famous. Uh, they're yeah. going out to the desert because they have nowhere else to go and that they yeah. are at rock bottom. 
So that's a lowering of himself. And in that moment, God fills him. Yeah. And it's the like strongest front possible of like the triune Godhead all in the same page. Yeah. Um, which I is really the, cool. You see the Trinity in this passage. You see the Father speaking from heaven. You see the Son being baptized. And you see the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. I need to reread Luke because Luke might say a dove. But yeah, it's it's a it's complicated. Let's okay. say that's a very complicated. <laughs> okay. That's part of what we should talk about this because yeah, in let's talk about it. Um, yeah, in the Aramaic, we learned this in Seattle or yeah. in uh, Portland. Remember, in the Aramaic version of the Old Testament. Yeah, which I almost i've I've been in uh, Bible higher education for seven years. Mm-hmm. I had never heard this. Yeah, and not even just I'd never heard this. I'd never heard the Aramaic version of the Old Testament. I was like, I thought they just kept Hebrew yeah. forever, forever, forever until like 100 or 200 mm-hmm. BC. And then they were conquered by the Greeks in the Maccabean revolt somewhere in there and then slowly assimilated to Greek. And at some point they were like, we need this thing in Greek because everybody knows Greek now. Yep. I thought that was the the linguistic heritage they yeah. had. And, and it, I didn't realize they had a long history of Aramaic. Babylon. Babylon yeah. was the main reason for that and the captivities that they had. And, and what's crazy and wild is Jesus probably knew Hebrew, probably, but his native language would have been Aramaic, which in some ways is wild because even tracing it back to the Hebrew, you may not even be hearing the Bible as, you know what I mean? Like, we, yeah. we get, it's like tr- it's, three transitions. The Hebrew is the faithful first Mm-hmm. Old Testament Bible. Yep. But Jesus and a lot of people in the New Testament only quote from the Septuagint, which yep. is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, but are probably highly influenced and maybe sometimes quote. And it's called the... Or allude what's to... What's it called? The, uh, ta- oh, the No, look it up. I, I had it and then I lost keep it. Keep talking and I'll come up so with the So this Aramaic version of the Old Testament uses this dove-like phrase for the Spirit. It's like a description of uh, wind. Or water, um, like it's a way that you and I would be like uh, the glass frosted, you know. We're like, well, what do you mean? Or it's got condensation on it, um, or the wind is blowing. Uh, it's got gale force winds, you know. Like it's it's a descriptor around this idea of the spirit. And so the first showing of this kind of usage in Aramaic is in Genesis when the spirit is hovering over the deep, like a dove. Is it is what it says in. Um, and what's it called? You're, I, I don't know. I think, I can't tell if Syriac is another name for that or a d- dialect or if it's the name of that. I think it's the Tar, Tar something. Targum? Targum, that's it. So the Targum is the name of the Aramaic Old Testament. Now, here's here's the crazy thing. That, like a dove yep, you're right. thing seems to be a seems to be a common way of describing something that's invisible but is but is totally there. So it's like yeah. how do you it's like describing a ghost. Like how do yeah. you describe it? Like it does it does it zoom around? Does it float around? Does yeah. it you know and so for them it's a dove carries peace. Um it carries a union, it, it carries uh you know a sign of creation or um, or power transfer, and it flies in a pretty peaceful sort of way. Yes, and it's not it's not coming in with harmful, you know, intentions. Like it is, it's kind of this symbolic way of basically just saying this thing that would be hard to describe was floating around <laughs> like a dove. Um, and so I don't know. Th- there's a lot of discussion around that. Personally, you know, I like to connect and go way super spiritualized with some some of the stuff. So I have to watch my role. But, uh, you know, Noah throws out a bunch of birds and the dove returns with the branch. So for me, I'm like, I could go super spiritualized with this and be like, so the dove came down and touched the Nazarite because Jesus is a Nazarite and that's branch. And so the dove was God sending it out from the ark of heaven and he's rescuing the people and he has now prepared a place for them yeah. to start again and like in Jesus go. he has found a land mm-hmm. in which he can yep. land exactly. his, his ship exactly he can come back to his people yeah. so like i i like that imagery you know i mentioned in my sermon i didn't get as many whoops and hollers as i expected but touched by an angel you know that's how they like symbolize the dove you know i'm this, sorry i don't remember the 1900s that well <laughs> 
sick bird. <laughs> <laughs> Mama, love you. And <laughs> so uh, what was her ne- name? Tina? No, Tessa. Tessa. How did I do that? How does that stay in my brain? But algebra left. You know what I mean? Like, what the heck? I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to say that's not true for me also. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, so that that's a pretty significant thing. And I think why we ended up pushing so hard on Sunday um, for others to get baptized was because we just realized, like, even Jesus needed to do this. And I had I had somebody come up to me afterwards and was just like, I'm so glad that you're helping people actually get to the wedding. And I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, look, a lot of people, they they accept the proposal from Jesus. And they yeah. accept him as like this awesome engagement. And they yeah. like, but they never get to the wedding day. And it's just, there's just something special about it. And it's not that their commitment isn't true or the love that they felt wasn't real. It's it's actually just the crescendo of that moment is this moment. And I, there's mystery in it. God works outside of baptism for salvation and some of that stuff. But I do think there's something going on in baptism, especially what Jesus commands. Because, I mean, we... There's so much to talk about in this, Ryan, because the moment God confirms yeah. Jesus is the one, then every word after this carries weight. I mean, yeah. just every word after this is like, oh, this is God's son. It's his literal voice. So then yeah. when Jesus ends the, you know, his ministry with basically like go out into the whole world and baptize, yeah, and you're like, okay, it's pretty important. Like, it's the last words you said. Like, we should probably do it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and all the all the gospel authors have their own way of setting up Jesus' credibility, and they're all saying this, talking from the same story, but for mm. their different audiences, yeah, and from their different lifestyle experiences and those kind of things, they emphasize different things to give Jesus credibility. Mm-hmm. Like Matthew has this, which in fact Matthew, Mark, and Luke all and John all mm-hmm. have the baptism account. All of them. So that's part of it, but. You're saying that every word out of Jesus' mouth after this is God, as you can see in the baptism account. Yep. Well, John does the same thing, baptism account, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure. Um, but he also, the very beginning of his gospel is, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Yep. And so many theologians for so long have talked about that when at the beginning of creation, when God spoke creation into being, that Jesus is the word, as he's talked about in the New Testament, and then that the spirit, the pneuma, the breath, the air, the wind, that would be uh, uh, Hebrew, the ruach, Mm -hmm. but but the spirit is the breath, Mm -hmm. and Jesus is the word. Mm -hmm. And so even in God saying a word, you watch the Trinity like on the move. God declares it, the breath provides the uh, the instrument, and then Jesus makes it so. There's a a liturgical scholar, Robert Weber, who talked about how uh, God always works through his right and left hand, the Son and the Spirit. Mm. I like that. Yeah. Anyway, but we can see right here that God is validating who Jesus is by the Spirit descending like a dove. And I don't think we talked about this a lot on Sunday. I think you referenced it for like one second. But like you said, uh, Genesis 8-ish, mm. the Noah's Ark story, where mm-hmm. they're in the flood, it's bad, and they send out a dove, and it comes back with an, with an olive branch, with a shoot, mm-hmm. which is what Nazarene mm-hmm. means, which is why they say at the end of chapter 2, this is why all the prophets say he will be called a Nazarene, mm-hmm. which none of them say that. None of them. But they do say, out of the tree of Jesse will rise a new shoot, a new branch. Yep. And whatever. So he'll be a he'll be a branch. Mm-hmm. So there's that whole connection. But there's also the connection with the spirit in Genesis one. Mm-hmm. In the beginning, oh yeah. God created the heavens and the earth. The spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And that's what you were trying to get at in the Targum and the mm-hmm. Aramaic version. Yep. Uh hovering. It was either that the word hovering was like a dove hovering mm-hmm. or that it threw in the word dove. Yep, And everybody had their thinking changed to think of dove in that way or to think of dove hovering over whatever, to tie the spirit to a dove in that kind of way, yep. which may be why some of them use this like a dove or use this as a dove, yep. maybe implied kind of mm-hmm. language, that both in, in what is happening here with Jesus, like the Noah story, God is finding dry ground to land on, prepared ground Absolutely. to live on. But also, God is about to create something new. Yes. Because the spirit hovering over the waters 
was the, like every Jew read the Old Testament. And I say Jews saying like ancient Israelite, not mm-hmm. like modern New York Jew or whatever. Mm-hmm. They made as well. But uh, in the ancient Jewish world, ancient Israelite world, they all read through the Bible a ton. They meditated over it so that as they kept reading through and through and through and through, yep. they would keep coming back and catching more and more. So this, like, they all know what's about to happen in the rest of chapter one. They're not, their minds aren't blank. They all yep. know the Spirit yep. of God was hovering over the waters, like, getting ready for something. This is the THX uh, intro at the beginning yep. of the movie that's like, yep. whatever. Yep. This is, like, the drum roll at the beginning. This oh, yeah. is, and they, they know what that means. So then the Spirit of God, like a dove, which is now in their theology and their thinking, is hovering over Jesus over the waters. He's about to create something new again. Oh, yeah, and it feels it feels so intense because it's as intense as Genesis Genesis 1 because it's, again, the waters of the Jordan that are symbolic for the Israelites. There's a lot, lot, a lot of stuff that's gone on at the Jordan, and you can read about some of that with Joshua and some of the, you know, there's a massive amount of stuff that has taken place. There also is this, this idea of repentance is turning back to something, but it's also like changing or turning to something new. And so for me, it's like God is doing a Genesis. And yeah. Genesis is a new beginning. That's what a Genesis yeah. means, a new beginning. And so so to say he's doing a Genesis is absolutely correct, even if it's not about the book Genesis. It's a Genesis. Yeah. So in my mind, this is a power, power showing of God going, I'm doing it again. I'm going to make everything right. I'm going to make everything whole. And we're all in, in, in perfect unison, and we're going after it. Um, and it's, it, it's powerful. I mean, it really is a, kind of one of those, you know, and, and I said this on Sunday, but I'm going to say it again. Like, Jesus doesn't have all the followers with him either. Like, this is yeah. not him bringing the crowds to watch. This isn't uh, Jesus showing up as the headline speaker of anything. Mm-mm. Nobody knows him. There are no announcement slides with his face He hasn't on called it. a single disciple. He yeah. hasn't, hasn't done a single miracle that he has recorded yet. Like, yeah. this is just him just going, like, I think I need to do this to make sure my dad and I are on the same page and like, we're good. And like, yeah. I need to do this so that the world knows that I'm coming and we need to do this so that John can get the word out that, that this has started when, you know, this is the, I know there's darkness in the world and listen, how hard would it be to be 30 years old and have seen pain, death and hurt and harm, possibly even losing your dad and knowing you have the tools to stop it. Yeah. And just being a carpenter. Just sitting back, waiting. Waiting for your time. Because it's not the time. And, I mean, this is wild. And then he's going not to the not to the temple to announce his campaign and to, you know, no, no, no. He's going out into the wilderness to some random dude for repentance. And is, yeah, in my mind, it, it just demonstrates again that Jesus is the most important figure in history for a reason. And there's a reason that even people yeah. that don't believe in him hold him in high regard. I was listening to TikTok the other day that he discovered that he needed spirituality. And so he started looking into every religion and he went through Hindu and he went to the, the Buddha stuff and he went through new age and he went through all Probably Jainism, yeah, everything. I mean, it was like, wow. And he said, I couldn't find a single one that had anything bad to say about Jesus. Yeah. They were all like, no, like he's pretty good. Like, <laughs> and he was like, okay. And then he got to Jesus and Jesus was like, I'm really the only way. And he was like, so logically it clicked in my head. And he's like, if all these other guys recognize that he was good, but he's saying, I'm the only way, I think they got it backwards. Yeah. And they were like, I think I need to just do what he says. Yeah. And it'll be okay. And it was like a complete logical expression. And I remember just thinking, like, that's actually a really good way of like recognizing that even even people that have slightly oppositional views to some of the things that Jesus said recognize that he was somebody worth following yeah, listening they to. may disagree with his claims that he is the son of god but they don't disagree with that he was loving worthy. others loving yeah you know, it's like yeah. all the things that he even taught it's like you know those yeah. are pretty good things yeah. so uh so i only asked one question this entire time yeah, and I, what, for what, a long time 40 minutes it's 35 30 uh, it's wild uh, but we knew that i knew yeah. that going into this because what, what's so a, loaded what's a question that maybe we didn't get to or is there anything that we didn't talk about? we talked about every question we had on this list without asking it the only question i think we could talk about mm-hmm. is and and go deeper into but more in the future of since this passage mm-hmm. what's the difference or 
or how does Jesus baptism figure into the rest of Christian baptisms? Yeah. What's the difference between Jesus baptism and the rest of them or what's the purpose or so I about think baptism. I think the thing that I bl- I blew up on Sunday that I've never talked about on Sunday in a way that I should have is that baptism isn't just about um, a contract or a covenant, and baptism isn't just about it being um, a ceremony or yeah. like a wedding. It's also the third needed thing, or at least one of the things that I've never probably neglected to talk about, which is the anointing aspect. Yeah, it really. It really is like the thing where I don't know what it does. I don't have it all figured out. I don't have it's not the, a formula. I don't have the mystery of what exactly happens, but there seems to be like a permission that you're giving God to to work in your life in a different capacity. Mm-hmm. This it's like giving him full access. There's it's been like, a question for a long time that's like, does the Holy Spirit show up in a believer's life the moment they get baptized? And there's a ton of evidence in scripture that it would, but there's also a good handful of exceptions to that rule. On either people side. getting the, the Holy Spirit before they get baptized in mm-hmm. the book of Acts and some people getting it after they get baptized, because like not immediately after, but like, mm-hmm. like later, later, like yep. years later. And so it, it, to me, it seems less like this is a formula, this is a guarantee, but uh, the way the Bible Project talked about anointing is they said the reason you you put oil on somebody is because it is a thing from the garden. It is a, it is anointing something is making it in some way a bridge between heaven and earth, and putting on it, covering it with some of the liquid life that God placed in paradise at the beginning of creation. So that's why oil makes a lot of sense. A lot of vegetation. It's also a lot of Genesis whatever. eight. It's an olive branch. Yes. I'm so, see, also that. <laughs> but also that's why water baptism functions not the same, but in a similar sort of way. It is the water part of it is the liquid life. That, birth control, a birth or birth canal. Like yeah. that's what it is. <laughs> so you birth said control. birth control. I was like what? birth canal. No, it's the it's the birth uh, canal. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is part of what you need to live, but also it is like. Uh, the passageway from death to life, mm-hmm. like when they were crossing the Red Sea or the Reed Sea mm-hmm. in the Exodus story, they're escaping Egypt. And in order to kind of commit to be Israel, yeah, like the final step is there's no going back. You following the dry ground that God has spl- split the, the mm-hmm. sea into, making it to the other side, and then him closing it on the enemy on the others. Yep. And that is like your final commitment. So you're following from death to life. And on top of that, you're following Jesus. Oh, you're yeah. imitating Jesus from death to life and committing to him. But I think all that being said, the anointing part that you were talking about, the liquid life to become a bridge between heaven and earth, you are, whatever happens with you and the Holy Spirit in baptism, you are declaring openness. And you, are, you, are, you are clicking, yes, I've read the terms and conditions. You are giving approval. Yeah. And it's it's one of those things that I think uh, I was learning about this this just this week that in every covenant that God offers, He always asks for consent. Yeah, He never demands the covenant. He yeah. always asks the people. Sinai he asks the people, and Jesus, follow yeah. me. It's a question. It, it requires consent. And I think in something as intimate as salvation, as intimate as the Spirit coming in and re- renovating your heart. As intimate as allegiance to Jesus. He is asking with the opportunity of consent, and this yeah. is full consent. This yeah. is saying, you do what you need to do, I'm all in, I'm all yours. Yeah, And that's why bridegroom and bride, I mean, all the imagery in the Bible is around the concept of full consent into intimate relationship. And that yeah. without that consent, it is not what it is. So standing up in front of a group of people, <laughs> saying it, and then doing it, uh, all of yeah. that is like full openness to God. And, it, and like you said with the Holy Spirit, I grew up in the Christian church, so the Holy Spirit was kind of like Robin to Batman. Like he, he was around, he was kind of important, but sometimes it seemed like he got us more in trouble than he yeah. helped. You know, And you're like, golly, what the heck? Now I feel like I feel like the Holy Spirit is more like the exact opposite of that, where I'm like Jesus and him are like tandem, like it is the Avengers more than you yeah. know a sidekick. And, and we mentioned this for a second, but I've had this theory, and if you think it's blasphemy, comment below. It is absolute the, blasphemy. Um, I'm just kidding. I've had this theory that uh, based on Luke and Acts, which are 
like part one and part two of the same story written by the same guy mm-hmm. uh, that cover Luke covers Jesus life and acts covers the continuation of the church. Yeah. Uh, trying to follow Jesus that starts with acts starts with, this is the, the account of, or something like that mm-hmm. of everything Jesus began, began to, to do. do. Mm-hmm. And there's this, when you read the book of acts, there's this, all these ways that Peter and Paul, these two examples of, Christians following in the way of Jesus who have received the Holy Spirit, they do a lot of stuff that's like, whoa, that looks like Jesus. So Jesus uh, healed the woman with the issue of blood. She came up and touched his cloak. And he was like, who touched me? I felt power go out from me. And you're like, whoa, that guy is radiating power. (laughs) Well, uh, even stronger and cooler than that. Shadows. Peter's, (laughs) Peter's shadow while he's walking by somebody heals somebody. It's like, can't stand broken legs or something like that. Uh, and Paul's like work apron, his like leather thing that he wore <laughs> yeah, to work. Somebody took it and started passing it around and is healing people. So even stronger than the power in Jesus, it's the power in Peter and Paul as and, those ordained to be the new Jesus is not that they're perfect, but yeah. that they're continuing his mission with the power of the Holy spirit. And as we're trying to learn how to do that and like figure out how to operate in that. Yeah. Um, I think it's funny that, most of the time why people don't come forward to receive this and to receive the baptism yeah. and choose to try to find this is because they don't want to look foolish. Yeah. That's it. They just don't want to look foolish. Yeah. But I think the truth of the matter is it's not about how faith-filled we can get so we can fulfill some of this stuff. It's what we're being taught is it's how how much are you willing to be foolish yeah. in order to see God work. How much to go full circle? Mm-hmm. How much are you willing to empty yourself to be filled up by God? I mean, I think we talked about this on Sunday. I'm, I'm almost positive that uh, this the Greek word here is kenosis, emptying yourself. And that is the same word, I think, at least the same idea as Philippians 2. Yep. For Christ, who did not consider equality. E- even though he was equal, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or think of grabbing the fruit from the tree. Or of the used for of his advantage. Used for his advantage. But instead humbled himself, taking the form of a servant, kind of skipping over the fact that he gave up heavenly riches and power to just be a human in the first place. And then as a human, he wasn't born into the greatest hospital, airport, palace, (laughs) like all the wealth. He was born into like a lowly stature. And it's, it's wild when you, when you start to realize this is just five verses and it has all of this sitting in the, at the background of it. And it really does become like, you know, obviously when you're you're probably watching this before the end of the story, like if you're just yeah. watching this in real time, you're just kind of like, wow, it's kind of cool. That's it. You yeah. know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah. it's not like anything really happened. You know, it's like there was this yeah. voice and now this guy, I guess, is here. And it's not like there's a crack, a huge thunder, or like all of a sudden, you know, Jesus goes super saiyan, yeah. you know, or like anything. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Or like he starts making bread right there, <laughs> or healing people. Like it's, it's all it's yeah. just a couple words and everybody's like, cool. And then, <laughs> and then I don't know how immediate it is, but all you see is Jesus going to the desert so, so quick. quick. Yep, he's just like, yeah, I gotta go. I mean, and that's I think <laughs> that's why I think it's easy to skip over this. Knowing yeah. what we know, though, going back and reading this, it is powerful. Well, this has been a great discussion. I hope it uh, piqued your interest. Go and look at some of the stuff we we mentioned. Um, as always, leave comments, questions, yeah. send us anything that we need to clarify. If there's some things, or even some things you thought were cool that uh, piqued your interest. Um, As always, you can click subscribe or share or leave a review. Um, It always helps us, uh, I think, reach more people and have an opportunity to teach other people that are curious. So, um, yeah. Thanks again for listening, Mom. I love you. Thanks, Mom. And uh, (laughs) have a great and glorious day in the Lord. We'll see you later. See you.